That's all I had for this morning. We want to enter into our worship at this time. We're going to do so with a word of prayer, and Brother John Hafer is going to lead our minds in prayer. At the appropriate time, Brother Kevin Smay is going to be leading thoughts on the Lord's Supper, and Corey Brown will be leading our closing prayer this morning. So let's enter into our worship with prayer. John, please. Will you pray with me, please? Our most great Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We just want to take time, Father, and thank you for all the special blessings in this life. We thank you, Father, for the ability to wake up in the morning and with the sunshine and with the rain. In this past week, it's been good to see both. We thank you, Father, for the great country we have to live in, and we thank you for the quietness and stillness of this land this morning and your protection and your guidance over it. We thank you, Father, for our good neighbors and, and those who, who, who help us out day by day. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you for those that care for us and care for our needs. We thank you, Father, for the ability to move about freely without fear. And we pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless us in this way. We thank you most of all, Father, for answering our prayers. We thank you for thy son. <clears throat> we thank you for the church. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who care for us when we need help. We thank you, Father, for our husbands and our wives and our children that believe in you. We thank you, Father, for the grace that was provided by your Son for giving us the first day of the week that we can come together and that we can remember his death and his burial and resurrection. Father, help us not to not help us not to neglect these blessings. Help us, Father, to appreciate them every day of our lives. Help us, Father, to help ourselves grow nearer to you by the things you have done for us. We pray, Father, that we will not be so narrow-minded and narrow-sided that we cannot see the things that are out there provided by you and that there is things beyond this world that's in front of our face that are more important than the troubles and the conflicts that we face, the, the bad health that we face, and that you have blessings out there for us if we would just look. We pray, Father, that you'll guide us, keep us in our steps, keep us in our faith, keep us in your Son. In his name we pray, amen. Continuing our worship, and as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, shall we sing, Lord, from your hand. If you're looking at a supplement, it's song number 93, Lord, from your hand. The soul, Lord, from your hand I take the bread. And from your cup I drink the wine. You serve forgiveness for my need. You serve your holy life for mine. Now from your lips I bear the words. This is my body and my blood. I see the mercy in your eyes. I see the pain. I see the love. I see the cross. I see your face. My God, what agony and grief. I see you suffer as you die. I hear you pray, it is for me. Oh, Jesus. 
Savior, Holy God. I live and breathe in your embrace. Lord, every moment draw my heart to love and serve you face to face. This morning before our comments here at the table, I just want to make sure that everyone has an emblems if uh, you came in, if you got those. If anybody needs those, raise your hand and we can get you some. This morning as we prepare to take of these emblems, I'd like for us to think a little bit about some of the individuals who were around Jesus during these last few hours before his crucifixion. Starting with the night when he was with his disciples and he instituted the Lord's Supper. He took the bread and he took the cup and he requested that uh, this be remembered. This, his body and the blood would be remembered in the future. As he did so, the one who would betray him, Judas, uh, leaves and goes to obtain the ones who would come and arrest Jesus. As Jesus is arrested, Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, and Jesus heals the servant. Then we see the events around Pilate and those who were accusing Jesus and the crowds that were crying, crucify him, and we know that Barabbas was released to satisfy the people, taking Jesus's Jesus taking his place. We've mentioned before about the centurions and the fact that they knew about death and they knew what death looked like and the cross and Calvary was a place of death. It was not a place of, uh, for a party. It was not a place you would go except to die. And we may notice that there were a number of people who came around the cross as Jesus hung there. We've noticed that there were the thieves that were hung beside him and one cried out to him to be remembered and Jesus said, you will be remembered. Today you will be with me in paradise. There were the centurions that took his garments and cast lots for them and there were the high priests and the nobles who came by the cross wagging their head and looked at him in the eye and said, you know, you could save others but you can't save yourself. And then there was uh, Jesus' mother Mary and John and Mary Magdalene and others who stood afar off and witnessed the things that were happening. But this morning I'd like to talk about two other individuals who were part of this equation that are unlikely participants. Because in their life they had been unlikely participants in who Jesus was. They were secret disciples. They were part of the Sanhedrin. They were well-to-do individuals who were leaders of the country, one of which was Nicodemus, who came by night and asked Jesus particular questions, fearful of what his relationship might be with Jesus if it was known. And later on, here in the story of the crucifixion, we learn of another man who was part of that Sanhedrin court who also likewise was a believer, but secretly. That's Joseph of Arimathea. I'm not sure exactly how it came about, whether uh, they were both near the cross while Jesus was being crucified or not. Scripture doesn't really tell us that. But somewhere in the equation with what had happened with the Sanhedrin, they, of course, knew 
of the deceit that the Sanhedrin and the hatred that the Sanhedrin had for Jesus. Nicodemus at one time had asked that the court deal rightly and justly with Jesus, giving him a fair trial. And there may have been others, we don't know. But somewhere in the events that happened when the crucifixion was happening and the sun went dark and the earthquake and all that happened, uh, that Jerusalem had to be just a, uh, alive with anticipation of what was going on. It was known by everyone. In the midst of all that, maybe the two of them had been near the cross. And somehow, Joseph of Arimathea determined that he was going to take care of the body of Jesus. And so he goes to Pilate, and one account calls it boldly. Another account says that he begged for the body of Jesus. And it must have been sometime towards the end of the crucifixion, at least Jesus' life here on this earth. Because Pilate was kind of amazed. Well, why would you be asking for the body of Jesus if he's not already dead? And he has a centurion summoned to find out that Jesus indeed is dead. And the reason why I bring these two men at particular in attention for us today is that each of us has played a part in all of these scenarios. Maybe we've believed from the beginning, but our faith has been tested as we see that the disciples are scattered after Jesus died. And maybe we uh, played the part of Judas at one point in time, or maybe Peter denying Christ. Whatever the case may be, we also are like them. But yet here in the midst of all of this confusion among the disciples, this uh, this, uh, war against God from those who were he had sent to save, there were two individuals specifically who stepped out from that position of being hidden believers and said, we know who he is. And this morning, as we gather around this table, we acknowledge, just like Joseph of Arimathea and others, who would step up and say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he came here and he died upon the cross. I saw him, Joseph said. And his body was laid in a, in a not a manger, <laughs> sepulcher. And we can talk about that later. But his body was laid there. And the key to some of this is that this wasn't a normal scenario for someone who died upon the cross. You could see Pilate's confusion. Why would you care about someone who died upon the cross? We just tossed their body over the hill into the pile. But he's taken into a tomb that Joseph had made for himself or at least his family. It was new. Wraps him, cleans him, I'm sure, his body, his physical body in some way, wraps him in very precious linens and place him in the tomb and rolls a stone over the entrance. And it says that Mary Magdalene and Jesus' mother watched it happen. They were part of that. Anyway, for us this morning, we are here to acknowledge that his body hung upon the cross. It was placed in the tomb, but it wasn't going to be there for very long. And we can discuss that later. And that his blood shed on the cross for us. And this morning, we stand to acknowledge that that's a fact. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we're here this morning, we're so thankful for the bountiful blessings that you give us, and especially for the sending of your Son, and for these eyewitnesses who uh, beheld him, they saw these things happen, and they recorded them so that we may know, so we, that we may believe that Jesus, your Son, is indeed Lord and Savior, and that his death and burial on, 
His death and his burial and his resurrection are sure. And as we partake of this emblem this morning, we remember that his body was broken on our behalf so that we might be brought back with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue this remembrance of your son's death upon the cross, we partake of this cup which represents his blood that was shed on the cross. Many men have died on the cross. Much blood has been shed. But it was only your sons coming from, from you to this earth to give of his life. It's the only way that we have to be brought back in right with you. His blood cleansing us from those things that separates us. As we partake of this cup, may we be uh, stronger in our resolve to be witnesses of this fact to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next song before the lesson is, I Will Call Upon the Lord. It, it is also in the supplement, song number 110, I Will Call Upon the Lord. And oh, I will call upon the Lord. Is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock that let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will look upon the Lord. He is all my righteousness. He will make his face to shine on me. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will wait upon the Lord. Will fill me with new strength. I will fly with wings like an eagle. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, the Lord. The song after the lesson will be song number 21 in the supper.
I'm assuming that uh, everybody heard the announcement that was made earlier concerning the uh, mask requirements and everything that is going on here. You know, this church right here, this, this group over the last year and a half has done very, very well for itself through all of this stuff that's been going on. Uh, I'm not sure how aware many of you might be with how things have uh, gone throughout the rest of the country and in other areas where it hasn't gone so well. Uh, people have actually left churches and taken other people. You have had church splits that have taken place in, in various churches over whether or not, uh, first of all, you should suspend worship and then if you do meet and uh, come together, whether or not you have to wear the mask. Um, is this, it's, this sounds really loud. Am I really loud? Yeah, Daniel, can you bring it down? Just, just thanks, Daniel. All right. Um, consider that for just a moment, though. This, this idea of a church where you have people who come together because of the word of God and they desire to serve God, they love God, they love each other, and, and they come together in unity with that, and then it comes to a point of whether or not you put a piece of cloth over your face that some would have the absolute insistence that you must put that cloth over your face, or on the other side, the insistence that you shouldn't put it, or you shouldn't have to, and that that, that issue, that question, that discussion has caused a church that up to that point was united together, loving one another, being with each other, serving God, being a beacon of light, and then it's split. It's not over some doctrinal position. Uh, it's not over the, the proper use of a thus saith the Lord. It's, uh, it's not a discussion of theological importance. I mean, it's not even the head covering issue or a discussion that at least uh, is revolved around a passage within Scripture and the understanding of what Paul was getting across. No, the, these churches have split over the question of whether one must wear a mask uh, or has the right not to wear a mask throughout this pandemic. That is the hill that people have decided to die on, and that's exactly what's happened. Churches have become mortally wounded based on this discussion. It's been a trying year and a half, hasn't it? I mean, just going back to, to what's taken place, uh, COVID fatigue has probably set in for a whole lot of people, and if it hasn't, it's probably settling in now. Um, particularly now, there are many people who are vaccinated, the CDC, the, the governor, uh, they're beginning to, to finally loosen some things for those who've had their vaccines. And yet, even then, it seems as if uh, all of this is, is meant to create some kind of division, some kind of uh, stance in which some people are entitled to certain things that others are not because of a decision that was made. Yeah, it's a light. Yeah, it, it's a light at the end of the tunnel. It feels like we're almost through this, and yet 50%, I'm sorry, over 50% of car accidents happen within five minutes of a person's house. Um, one of the things that attributes to that is as people are coming home, they're tired. They're done with their day, they're almost home, their attention, their focus to detail goes down, they're just ready to be home and things get put on autopilot and they get so close to home and then it gets ruined. It's kind of where we are right now. We're so close to all of this being over. We've done so well for the past year and a half or so and yet right now if we're not careful Due to, to COVID fatigue, we could end up losing our focus, taking our sight off of what's really important, what it is that we've been doing, and end up being the exact opposite of what we were called to be as Christians who joined together as a church 
here together in Salem, those who treat one another, as we talked about a few weeks ago with, with what we call the golden rule. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 7, whatever you wish others would do to you, so also do to them. This morning, what I want to do is revisit something we've talked about before. That is, how we are to biblically and appropriately maintain unity as a group, even in the midst of differences in understandings and assumptions. Because, folks, we have a lot of differences. And we need to make sure that we continue to stay united in those. Good morning. Good to be here this morning. We've got a good crowd with us here this morning, a whole lot of folks. It's just, it, it's good to see those who are uh, coming back out and being able to be with us once again, and uh, just the faces that are starting to become normal again, that for so long we were missing and we hadn't seen. And uh, we really appreciate that aspect of now having more people with us here. And also we have visitors who, who have come here to be with us. And we're really glad that you are here, uh, that you have chosen to be with us this morning. It says an awful lot about you, that you care about your relationship with God, uh, that you want to please God. You want to know more about his word. And the fact that of all the places that you could have gone, you chose to be here. Well, that's pretty neat. Um, makes us feel special. It really does. We're glad you're here. Uh, and I hope that we can all be encouraged as we look at these principles that are so important for maintaining unity, uh, especially the unity that's found within a church. Now, understanding, first of all, how we maintain this unity begins with making sure that we understand that there are different areas of belief. What I mean by that is there are different types of beliefs that we're going to hold. Um, and it's important that we begin understanding this. First of all, there are the non-negotiable beliefs. These are the things that we believe, and they're, you know, We've studied it through, we see it, this is absolute, this is core, this is foundational. The scriptures are not vague on this. Uh, they're, they're very, very clear and adamant. These are non-negotiable. Without these, there is no real community fellowship within the church. If one does not hold to these, it is difficult for me to consider such a person a true brother such as you find in 1 John chapter 2, verses 22-23. Who is the liar but the one who denies Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, or, or this is the one who sets himself up against Christ. He who denies the Father and the Son, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Inherent. In this right here is that we understand and we see that Jesus is the fullness of deity in bodily form. He is God incarnate. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Verse 14 of John 1, that Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we saw the glory of God. We beheld the glory of God, of the only begotten of the Father, who is full of grace and truth. This is non-negotiable. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what belief is all about, right? At the end of John, we've been harping on this. John says, many other signs and wonders did Jesus perform in the presence of his disciples. But these, John says, these have been chosen so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. That is something that you cannot be a Christian if you don't believe. That's what Christianity is all about, to get you to believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So that is the first thing that I wanted to bring out. And, and there are a lot of non-negotiable beliefs, by the way. I'm just going to bring out a couple of illustrations here uh, just to demonstrate what we're talking about, things that are very clear in John 14, 6. You're familiar with this. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That is a non-negotiable. There is no other path to get to the Father 
that does not go through Jesus. Yeah, if, if you try to go around him, if you try to ignore him, if you try to create your own path, you know, it's, uh, there, there's a saying out there that people say, well, you know, if you're looking down on a mountain, you see that there are many different paths that reach up to the mountain, and maybe Christianity is just one of those paths up to the top. And you say, well, no, that's not accurate. <laughs> there is one path. There are not many paths that are going to get you to the top. There is one path. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father unless they come through me. Jesus is very clear. This is non-negotiable. There is not another path that we can choose. So it's important that we understand there are non-negotiable beliefs. And yet, what we also need to understand is that there are non-negotiable beliefs that each individual is going to hold that may not be the same as a non-negotiable belief that someone else. These that I'm talking about right here, I'm going to refer to as the core non-negotiable beliefs. That's what these are, the fundamental ones that everybody has to have. These are the sine qua nons. These are the ones that everybody has to adhere to to have fellowship with one another. But at the same time, there are what we would call individual, non-negotiable beliefs. You know, one of the crazy things about the New Testament text, there is no catechism. There is no laid out creed. There is no codified system of law. You don't read through the New Testament and it say, okay, now according to what you do when you come to worship, the first thing is X, Y, and Z. And then after that, you must do this. And then after that, this. And then after that, this. It's not there. You don't even have a place set out that says, hey, when it comes to being somebody who has been saved by the blood of Christ, and here's the path that you take to get there, you know, a certain passage of Scripture that says, and whereunto, if you decide you will do this, the first thing you must do is this, and then following that, this, and then following that, this. It's not there. There is no codified, step-by-step, everything that you see, procedure that's laid out. Uh, it doesn't make it easy on us. The New Testament doesn't say, this is what you have to believe for everything possible. Do you know why it is that so many various denominations use catechisms, creeds, or confessions? They do it because it makes it easier. <laughs> I mean, it really does. It'd be so much easier if this just simply said, all right, I'm going to give you a list of do this, don't do that, believe this, don't believe this. But it doesn't. We read the Gospels, and they don't give us a codified law. They tell us about Jesus the Messiah. We read the letters where Paul is helping churches who are dealing with their problems. And you know what? We don't have those same problems. It's, it's very often, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio that we're dealing with the same thing that those churches are dealing with. I have never been involved in a church before where I had to worry about the Jew and Gentile relationship, and yet that's one of the biggest issues that they faced in the, in the New Testament. Paul spends so much time talking about the Jews and Gentile relationship, and I've never faced that. We don't deal with Gnosticism, tearing our churches apart. There are other letters that we find throughout here. They, they do the same thing. They're helping those people in their day, in their time, to do what they needed to do. And what we have to do is read through that, figure out what it meant for them, and then say, okay, is there some way in which this is analogous to the stuff that I'm going through? Is there some way that this is applicable if I find the principle that's involved? Well, I may not deal with the Jew-Gentile relationship, but maybe I deal with a racial relationship in some other way. Or some other problem where people are bringing baggage from a previous life spent in sin and coming in. How do I deal with that? How do I handle it? We come up with those applications, and it's a lot of work to do it right. It's a lot of work, and that's the problem. Sometimes it seems like it's almost too much work. Give me a book. 
Uh, give me a series of magazines. Give me something that's going to break it all down. Give me something that's going to do all the translating for me, that'll tell me what the do's and the don'ts are. Even if it's thrice the size of the New Testament, that's fine. It's still going to be a whole lot easier. Therefore, one person may come to a conclusion. When people are reading through this, one person may come to a conclusion, and, and to them, it is a non-negotiable situation which someone else may not even question. I mean, consider the manner of splits, church splits that have taken place. Well, this is how. It's because people don't agree on what is negotiable and what is not. Just for the sake of, of illustration, does Jesus instruct to drink from one cup when partaking of the Lord's Supper together? Or um, is he just making a statement that they all are supposed to drink of something? Remember he said, take this and drink uh, all of you. Well, what's he telling them to do? What is the authority that anybody has for forming Bible classes and separating the church into different groups and putting them into different rooms when they come together? What's wrong with giving money to an organization that's training men to preach the gospel and the church sponsoring those various organizations? It's helping to fulfill the Great Commission, right? Should Christians have to wear face masks in the assembly? Or should we not? Where do we stand with such questions? Are these things non-negotiable? Are they things that we can allow some wiggle room for? Can you see how, how non-negotiables tend to work? Every person has to figure out for themselves what the non-negotiables are. Now, keep in mind, like I said before, there are certain core non-negotiables. Jesus is the Christ, right? That is a core non-negotiable. Um, you know, we understand that. But then there are some other things that we have to figure out for ourselves and come to the conclusions for ourselves. Am I willing to be negotiable on this? Is this worthy of consideration? Now, that's an in, the individual non-negotiable non -negotiable beliefs. That's another type. But we need to also allow for church, that is, collective group beliefs. Remember, church, is, it's the people of God, and in particular, the people of God who are part of this congregation right here. Consider how difficult it would be if every single person here had to believe exactly the same thing on every single item. You know, I've, I've made this illustration before, but maybe some of y'all haven't heard it, um, and, and so I'm just going to throw this up. The story is told uh, of a man who'd been on a deserted island for uh, 20 years, and when he was rescued, someone finally found it, he was rescued, they came up, and, and there were uh, these three huts that were there, and they said, well, what are these huts here that, that you have, that you've built? He said, oh, well, that first one is where I live, and that third one over there is where I go to church. And they said, well, what about the one in the middle? He says, oh, that's where I used to go to church. Yeah. Sometimes that's the way it is, isn't it? Sometimes we, we disagree so much that we, we can even disagree with ourselves. Um, you know, it, it's kind of ridiculous to assume that on every possible point there is, to assume that there's going to be absolute agreement on it. This is how it is when people are, let me say, unable to allow themselves to follow the Romans 14 principle, in which, in Romans 14, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, uh, but there were some who didn't believe that a Christian should be involved in eating meat. And because, you know, in Romans, the, the whole discussion is about Jews and Gentiles, and it was the Daniel principle and, you know, going in and not eating the meats and all of that. Or that they had to observe special days, uh, such as the Sabbath, the feast days, and things like that. And then on the other side were people who believed the opposite. 
Well, what was the resolution? Because you've got half the church over here that says, I can't eat meat. It's sinful to eat meat. I have to obey the Sabbath and other holy days. And then you have half the church over here who says, yes, you can eat meat. And who says, you don't have to observe those holy days. Well, what is it that they're supposed to do? How is it that they are able to resolve this? Does Paul say, here's how you resolve it. Just keep studying and studying and studying on it and continue to harp on it with each other and make sure that you get to the point where everybody believes exactly the same. If you've turned over to Romans 14, like I said, we'll get there in a little bit, Paul doesn't say that. What he says is, you know what? You just keep doing what you're doing. Whichever side you're on, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep believing what you're believing. And he says one side is not to judge the other, and the other side is not to hold the other side with contempt. It is certainly possible. Now, it's imperative that people within a church are allowed to believe differently concerning things. Things even that they are looking at from the text of the Bible. The question is, if they believe differently, how can they worship together? Um, the church as a whole has to hold stances on certain issues, on certain things. One that is fairly representative of the group. One that allows inclusion for everyone who holds these beliefs. Uh, the issue comes when you have something that forces an individual to participate in something that they hold as a non-negotiable, such as the issue with the one cup uh, situation that I referred to earlier. There were people who believed that when Jesus said, take this cup and drink from it, all of you, he was by apostolic example, or that's even Jesus' example, uh, he is telling them, this is how you have to do it. This is the precedent that has been set. You've got one cup and you all better drink from that one cup. And he was instituting it very importantly that that was the issue, that that was important. Well, there would be nothing at all wrong with our using one cup here. Uh, I mean, <laughs> outside of COVID protocols, of course, I'm sure. Um, but as a group, we use many cups. We did that pre-COVID. We've always, I'm assuming always, I don't know, I don't know the his, full history, at least for the last, uh, since we got here in December of 19, I know we've used multiple cups, and I'm going to assume before that for quite a while, we used multiple cups here. Well, for anyone who holds the one cup as a non-negotiable belief, they can't be a part of this group because that causes them to go against a non-negotiable belief that they have. And they can't function within this. I mean, starting in September, we're going to, again, have Bible classes for various ages before we worship together. Now, there are many individuals uh, who believe out there, who believe that you can't find separate Bible classes within the New Testament. Therefore, we have no authority uh, because it is silent on that, therefore, we should not be doing it. But we here, we believe there's nothing at all wrong with having those Bible classes. And as a group, we have classes for all ages as a way to help everyone grow in the Lord. So for anyone who holds a non-negotiable belief about no Bible classes, they cannot be a part of this group because that is something with which they would have to participate. During the pandemic, we decided to, to suspend worship for a while. And then when we returned last July, it has been different, hasn't it? I mean, it's not the same. Um, a lot of it's great, but we don't sing nearly as many songs. Uh, you know, we don't do things such as the scripture reading. I know many of you all probably wish that the sermons would have been truncated maybe just a little bit, but that hasn't changed. Sorry about that. Um, but there are many people around the country who actually felt that suspending worship was obeying God, uh, was obeying men rather than God. That's the 
non-negotiable belief that they had. And whereas the reasoning here is that we're submitting to the authorities in a way that does not violate our relationship with God because we found other alternatives that worked. They may not have been as effective. But yes, churches split over this issue of whether or not you could or could not suspend your worship. Because to some people, based on what you find in Acts, this was a non-negotiable belief. You have to be there no matter what. So the important thing is knowing what your non-negotiable beliefs are and challenging them, by the way, to make sure that they really are as important as you think that they are from a scriptural perspective. And then also make sure that you know the church's official stance on what those beliefs are. And sometimes, you know what the church's stance might be? We don't have one. We don't have an official, this is what the church believes about X, Y, or Z, and you know what? That's fair. That is legitimate. If you'll notice so far, I'm not using very much scripture this morning. I'm sure you've probably noticed that. And it's because we're discussing matters that just aren't talked about. And that's kind of the point, is that these things aren't dealt with. How we handle them, what we do, how we deal with the disagreements, the differences, and all of that that we have, it's just not clearly codified or outlined in some codified sense. Now, the scriptures I'm spending the most time with are, are Romans 14, 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10, which both promote the same principle, the same idea, even though they're different subject matter. But the point being, there are plenty of matters for which we just don't have absolute, solid, definitive answers that are clearly black and white and that there is no gray area. We need to recognize that and say, that's okay. Usually the things that cause divisions, the, the non-negotiable beliefs that people hold that make them pick up their ball and take it elsewhere, they rarely concern matters that are just absolutely clearly laid out in scriptures. They're usually often over matters that are a little more nebulous, a little unclear, matters that have a gray area, and then in those, somebody says, well, I'm going to definitively answer this once and for all. And they study it, they study it, they study it, and they figure it all out, and it's black and white now. And to them, they hold everybody else accountable to the conclusions that they've drawn based on the scriptures. And if you don't come to the exact same conclusion that I've come to, you're wrong, and we can't be in fellowship any longer. People create non-negotiable beliefs where the scriptures don't really give nearly as much support as assumed. And then they find out those non-negotiable beliefs uh, don't mesh very well with the church official stances. So what happens then? Problems. At best, a person talks uh, to, to some of the eldership and they might decide that uh, this matter of discussion is not as important as they thought it was. Or they might decide to maybe amiably part ways and find a group which holds to their non-negotiable beliefs. But even then, leaving the church is never a good thing. And, and in Romans 14 and in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, that's not the answer that Paul gave. He didn't say, you know what? Why don't you just, uh, let's form a, a Jewish church over here, a Gentile church over here, and y'all do what y'all want to do. That's never been the answer. Even then, that's not usually how it goes. Usually the one who holds this new belief, which is now a non-negotiable, finds any and every attempt he can to bring it up in Bible classes or private conversations, begins trying to sway as many as he can to his way of thinking or understanding. He will challenge the leadership challenge the teaching, challenge the, the work of the eldership. Uh, he will go on until he's finally disciplined for being a divisive person, at which point he's going to go around and vomit all the bad stuff about the church, which is stuck in their old ways and traditions, unwilling to think for themselves and be enlightened and change, or sometimes the opposite, a church that has, in their opinion, left the old paths of proper Christianity. I am fully convinced that many of these divisions, large 
small, which have taken place through the years, could have been avoided. It's, if people would have just stepped back and asked themselves, is this really non-negotiable? Is there any way for me to follow through with my belief and maintain fellowship? Now, I'm going to bring up an issue that perhaps many of you will not be aware of, and that's not a bad thing. But there were some splits within churches of Christ that took place back in the 50s and 60s over a question, can you take money from a church's treasury and give it to an institution so that they can perform the work of a, cho- of, of, of a church? And I, I'm not going to rehash this debate. Again, if you're not familiar with this, I apologize if this is lost on you. That's not a big deal. That's probably a good thing. But I will ask this. What if the church had simply told people that wanted to, wanted the church to contribute to these institutions, why don't you just reduce your contribution to the church and then individually send what you want to to these institutions? I mean, Peter said it's your money while it was still yours, right? You can do whatever it is that you want to do with it. That from Acts chapter 5. Would that not have allowed an opportunity for everyone to continue working together? Again, I know it's oversimplistic. I wasn't alive for the debate and and the tension and everything in the air. I'm sure it was much more complicated than that. My only purpose is to demonstrate there are ways available to work around people's non-negotiables without having to split a church apart. All of this to say, know what those non-negotiables are. Know how they fit in with the church, and in so doing, you're going to determine which of your beliefs are negotiable or not. Those beliefs which you hold, but you know that not everyone else has to hold them, including the church itself. And so this is kind of how this works uh, when we go to Romans chapter 14, and we take a, just a very brief look at what's going on. As for the one, he says, who's weak in the faith, welcome him. But not to argue over opinions. One person believes he can eat anything. The weak eats vegetables only. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, I don't want to get too in-depth into this passage. I have the four. I'm sure we will again. And doing so this morning is going to take us down a slightly different trajectory than I'm wanting to follow. But this passage talks about differences in thought concerning, again, the differences between Jews and Gentiles in the first century. Whether eating these meats or not following what's uh, known as the Daniel diet. Remember when Daniel went in among the Gentiles and he only ate vegetables. And that was the way that a lot of Jews thought when you were out in Rome or various places, that's how you had to do it. And so that's the way that some of these um, Jews in that first century situation would have thought of it. And this is paralleled 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10, which is talking about pagans who become Christians and then eating meats sacrificed to idols that were part of their paganism before. Um, In these scenarios, what I want to get out of this is, is not exact exegesis of the problem. It's the way in which the differences are addressed. Nowhere does Paul tell anyone that they have to believe the exact same thing. He does not tell them, you must study it, study it, study it, study it, study it, study it, until everyone believes the exact same things on the issue. People who believe they cannot eat meats due to being a Jew or they feel it's wrong to eat meat sacrificed to idols as an ex-pagan, in both instances, the answer, continue believing that without having to have more studies. And those on the other side, they continue to believe what they believe as well. And contrary to popular belief, there are matters of sinfulness. That's what these are talking about. These are matters of a sin- sinfulness. They're not simply matters of opinion. That's a, a phrase that gets bandied a lot when you talk about Romans 14. No. To them, this is a sin or not sin discussion. If I eat this meat, I am sinning. This is not just a matter of opinion. This is a matter of sinfulness that they're discussing. And this is still Paul's answer. These are matters where there's confusion concerning what is negotiable. 
And without going through the whole passage, here's the answer. Believe what you're going to believe without judging the other side or being annoyed by them. That's biblical unity. That is what it means to be of the same mind together, which is not believing everything exactly alike. And I use that phrase because when you go into chapter 15, which is still the same discussion, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not simply to please ourselves, but each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scripture we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you will with one voice glorify the God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God this is the end result of that Romans 14 discussion which again he never once said study this out until you believe the exact same thing the entire thing, he says, y'all believe what you believe, y'all believe what you believe, and then notice the language here at the end. He says, bear the burdens of the other side. Now, I don't want to go into strong and weak or all of that discussion. Those are terms that Paul uses here. They don't necessarily apply in every application of this passage, but the application absolutely applies. Whatever side you are on, Bear with the other side. Think of things from their position. Demonstrate empathy. Do what you can to help them get through what they are going through. And he says, don't just do things to please yourself. Not focusing on self and getting what's rightfully yours. I mean, that phrase is crazy, right? Let us please his neighbor for his good in contrast to pleasing ourselves. Paul tells the Corinthians, why not just be wronged? Is it so bad that you can just put up with a little bit so that your brother is able to be pleased? Why not be wronged? This goes back to the Sermon on the Mount, the last lesson we had from it. However you want to be treated, so treat other people that way. That's the golden rule. In other words, after you've studied something out, after we've come to our conclusions based on what we're able to glean from the Bible, and we're making application to the very best of our understanding, do we want someone who has a, a different understanding, who has studied it out, come to a different understanding, a different conclusion, to insist that his and only his conclusion, which you've already considered, and you've already said, yeah, I don't see that that is valid, that that is the only one that's acceptable, and that's the only way that you can understand it, take it or leave it? Do we want people to say that to us? No. So we shouldn't be saying that to them. Would we want someone to continue to harp on it? find any and every reason to try to sway our understanding, maybe making snide remarks, tangential Bible class topics when you're talking about one thing, and then it slides over to talk about this issue over here, talking to other people to get them on their side, insisting on talking about it all the time. No, we wouldn't want that. So we can't do it to them. Again, you've studied it. You're confident in your conclusions. You've considered his view. You've rejected it for one reason or another. But the reasons just aren't valid. This is a negotiable belief. Wouldn't you want him to allow you to have some different belief in, in, in peace? Jesus' statement from the Sermon on the Mount suggests that it's important to offer this as well to him. Again, we are dealing with what would be considered negotiable individual beliefs. I mean, that's what we're looking. Here's Paul's take on it. Paul is willing to go without, meeting, without eating meat again if that's going to benefit his brother. What are we willing to give up? Folks, this is being like Christ. 
This is regarding others. It's more important than ourselves. This is what it's like, as Paul says right here, to live in harmony with one another, with one voice glorifying God. That one voice glorifying God doesn't mean that the voices all have to say the exact same thing on every issue. But we can live in harmony and one voice together even if we believe differently on certain things. It's not about studying and studying and studying until we all agree with each other. And don't hear what I'm not saying. Of course, spend your time studying it. Look into it. If someone challenges something that you think or believe, Look into it. Study it with them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that you just ignore it. But when you come to an impasse, it has been studied. Both sides see it differently, contrary to what many in our heritage have fiercely held on to for a couple centuries now. That's okay. You can believe something differently and be united together. Remember, there are certain core non-negotiable beliefs and we've talked about those. And you have certain non-negotiable non -negotiable beliefs, which are, you must allow, to be debatable. But these are beliefs that you hold, and you realize that whether someone else believes the same thing or not, it has no bearing on you. It doesn't affect you. There's nothing about it that's going to change your relationship with God. I know many strong Christian men who have served in the military, I know there are men here who have served in the military as Christians, and I want to say I am thankful for your service. I honor you. I honor your sacrifices that were made to the country, and I am thankful for everyone who serves in the military. I could not myself conscientiously do it. I just, I couldn't. My purpose is not to tell you why right now, and I would say the why probably doesn't even matter because it doesn't affect you and your service to God. It doesn't change my relationship with anybody. It does not change how I view you or think about you if you have served in the military because I know that I know that I know that your service pleases and honors God as you did it perhaps to honor country and honor God, just as my own conscientious objections, I believe, honors God. Right now, we are faced with some questions concerning getting a vaccine, wearing masks in worship, things which actually aren't even biblical in their nature. There's nothing in here that, that talks about any of this, but for some reason they've caused churches to split and people to feel at odds with one another because they have different views. These are stances, or there are stances that a church takes on certain things. Um, I would assume, concerning, like, say, the military question, they don't take stances. And these things are not hard and fast. They're more negotiable, which, which allow people who understand things differently to be together and to feel comfortable being a part of this church. Um, the elders have taken a stance on masks, that they ask everyone to continue to wear one. Even if the government says you don't have to, they're simply asking to do it in solidarity with those who do still have to wear masks by government mandate. It's foregoing our own personal rights uh, in order to stand with those who are still burdened, bearing the burdens with them, not allowing division to occur or allowing what happens here to be used to, for political purposes in some way to create a divide between us of those who do, those who don't. And if you hold beliefs which differ from others, even from the leadership, then you understand the situation. If it's not a core, non-negotiable belief, I don't think this has a pointer. Imagine the, the red dot the, from my fingers going into that little blue circle right there. All right, uh, if it's not one of those core, non-negotiable beliefs, the sine qua non that everybody has to agree with, if it's outside of that box, we can think, circle, we can think differently from one another. You can believe what you, still, what you believe and still have fellowship with me if I believe something differently. Folks, we've got a great group here. There is great chemistry among those who are part of this group. There is a lot going on for this church family. Let's make sure 
We're not allowing any of that to be overwhelmed uh, by some need to create debate, dissension, division unnecessarily. We need to have discussions. We need to discuss issues. People need to know where we stand or don't stand as a church on various issues. We need to reopen various issues and discussions for reevaluation from time to time. But we also need to make sure these discussions do not occur at the expense of the unity that's been created and fostered throughout the years. Let's pray together. Our great and almighty God, every person here desires to honor you first and foremost. Help us all to do so with one voice together, being able to agree where agreement's necessary and disagree where that is best as well. We thank you uh, that you've made your word more challenging to us so that the benefits we reap will be even greater. Help us all to live in unity with one another as we are unified through your Son. We thank you for Jesus, and it is through him we pray. Amen. You know, there is one other non-negotiable that is pretty important that Paul brings out in, in Romans 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a single person who can make claim that they have not sinned, if they have reached that point where they understand the law, that they understand not just uh, right and wrong, but good and evil, they understand their moral condition before God. And right now, if you are here and you understand that your sins have caused a separation between you and your God, you also know that there is an answer for that that you can be baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you can start on a path of discipleship, which was going to end in life, eternal life, basking in the glory of God. This morning, if you are here and you are ready to make that commitment to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, uh, we're going to sing this song on bended knee, as we sing this song, if you are ready to make that decision, come to the front, have a seat, and we'll assist you. If we can help you in any way, please come forward as we sing this song, your invitation. On bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy Lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love anew, I worship you in spirit, I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy praise unto you. On bended knee I come, with a broken heart I come, bowing down before your holy As I look upon your face, show your mercy and your grace. Change my life, O oh Holy Spirit. Make me ever new. Make my life a holy sacrifice. To you. Thank you, Chris. Some, some good things to think about. Thank all of you for being here this morning. And invite you back if you're visiting. It's good to have you here. We want to close at this time with a word of prayer. And Brother Corey Brown is going to lead us. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you so very thankful father for this day and 
for the blessings of this day and for this time that we've been able to come together and, and worship to you. We pray, Father, that we've pleased you with what we've done here this morning. We pray that we'll continue to please you every day this week. Father, before we leave here this morning, we want to pray for those that were mentioned this morning that are struggling with health issues. We uh, pray for Alan Fussell, for Helen Harrow, for Rob Kennedy. We just pray, Lord, that you would be with them and, and be with those that are uh, giving the treatments that they're getting and pray that they might be successful and they would regain their health, Father, if that's your will. Father, we pray also for those that are grieving at this time. We pray in particular for Mary Martha at this time and just ask that you would be with her and uh, guide her and, and help her to uh, look to you in this time of loss and change. Father, we pray that you would go with us all now, uh, be with us, keep us healthy, and keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray, amen.